So the title of the presentation, DQMH, Decisions Behind the Design. My name is Fabiola de la Cueva. You already know the joke. You can call me Fab, as in fabulous and modest. modest. <laughs> there you go. Especially modest. I started Delacor. I used to work for NI. I worked for NI from 2000 to 2006, and then started Delacor and have been doing uh, consulting ever since. And uh, I am very proud that our team won an award on Monday. So Delacor, team is such a good. One product of the year award. The Bitly address that you see there, that's where I'm going to, well, the videos that I'm going to be showing are already up there, but they have no sound. Once we have the, record, re the uh, recording of this presentation, I'm going to record sound over the videos, and they will be posted there. So if you want to take a picture of my lovely team with an award, I mean with the address, so you can check the videos later. All right. Is Jeff K on your payroll, too? <laughs> <laughs> no, it, I guess... The red, the red shirts. Please, no, no association with Star Trek. We're gonna stick around. You're next gen. You're not, so you're not, you're not classic Star Trek. Yeah, not classic Star Trek. Star Trek. All right, this is our leadership team. So we have Luis over here, Chris, myself. Luis and I are in Austin. Chris is in Europe. I mean, not in Europe anymore. Um, so my plans of taking over the European uh, segment is completely ruined now. Um, <laughs> so our little baby doll is much nicer. Yeah. So some of the services that we provide at Delacor is software architectural design and implementation, automated test strategy, uh, best practices training, hardware design, test station management. Our main focus is working with teams of Lavio developers that don't have a software engineering background. And they realize that they're actually doing software development. And we help them set up the tools to do source code control, bug tracking, uh, code reviews, figure out what their style guideline is, all that type of stuff, and all the way to their architecture. And one of the things that we do is help you automate the architecture that you already have or the tools that you already have. We cannot show you what we've done for other customers, so we decided to create DQMH as a way of putting it on the Labitools network. When a customer calls, we can totally say, go download, download DQMH, check the documentation, check the automation tools, that's what we can do for you. So, so you don't get to build up that customer. I don't get what? You don't get to build that customer. I, that customer doesn't pay, yeah, but there's a, there's a lot more involved with software okay. engineering practices. Yeah, we're just, just really nice. <laughs> um, all right, so the very first thing I'm gonna, okay, how many here are already using DQMH? Okay, how many of you have evaluated it. All right? Okay. So, first thing is there's different ways to get it installed on your machine. The easiest one is just Google DQMH. You can also go to BI Package Manager, search for DQMH and you'll find it, or go directly to ni.com Lavi Tools, or go to Delacor. Um, this is an example of one of the videos that are to come. In this particular one, I'm just showing how you can just go to uh, Google, type DQMH, and the first hit that you're going to get is the download page from National Instruments. And there's down there is our page as well. And then you click on download through VIPM. That launches VIPM. VIPM starts with LabVIEW since LabVIEW 2013. DQMH works with LabVIEW 2014 or later. You accept the license, you install it. When you're done, you have all those packages installed. And once you have it installed, what you end up with is a new project template on your create project. So when you click on create project, now you have Delacor QMH listed as one of your projects. So if anybody comes and tells me that it's hard to download the QMH and that's why you have not evaluated, I'm gonna be upset. <laughs> <laughs> See, I can be a little British. Just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I should have said I would be disappointed, sorry. See, I'm in training, I'm in training. No, the British would be, I would think you have one a single brain cell. <laughs> All right, so I'm not gonna repeat that one. Uh, once, once you get the DQMH installed and you're getting it started, you're gonna get this. Uh, sorry, Mr. Super CLA is not included. I just like to add him to my slides to see if people are paying attention. So what is DQMH? DQMH stands for Delacor Cued Message Handler. Woohoo! All right. 
<laughs> they're ready to it's win. It's like a prize win. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard so, so much about it. It's just that you can make, yeah. It's accessible to and I support. That was one of the things that we wanted to do. It's accessible to CLDs, but CLAD uh, level developers can contribute to, in a DQMH project. Works with Testan. That was one of our goals, that it would work out of the box with Testan. Uses uh, object-oriented programming, but does not require understanding it. You don't have to understand or love object-oriented programming or know anything about it to use DQMH. But if you know it, you can extend it. Supports multiple instances, and the scripting tools reduce anxiety regarding the creation of uh, user events. And did I mention that we won an award? <laughs> All right. OK. So first, who's familiar with the National Instruments Q message handler? Wow, great. So can I skip the two-minute introduction? <laughs> Just as a refresher, and for the few people that didn't ask, uh, didn't raise your hand, brace yourself. I'm gonna do this in less than two minutes. You guys ready? Okay. You have to be paying attention. There we go. Okay. So, in IQ image in less than two minutes. You go to the getting started, you select your Q message handler, you get this project, if you go directly to the main, you're gonna see that you have an event handling loop that's gonna handle the end user interactions with the front panel. And then the loop on the bottom is going to be the message handler loop, and that's where you're going to be handling your queued messages. It's a queued message handler, right? All right. On the left, you have a cluster that has the local data. This is the data that's going to be used throughout the different cases in your message handling loop. On the lower left, we have the message queue. It holds the message and that are going to be handled by the message handling loop. And on the, inside the loop, we have the DQ. This is the VI that's going to tell us what's the next message and the next case we're going to go into. All right, and on the right, these fellows here are the error handlers. If there is an error, they're going to enqueue the error case in the message handling loop. So what happens when there's an error, you go to the error case, and the errors from both loops are handled here. And how does it stop? If the end user closes the front panel, then we discard the event. We basically said, no lab, you don't do what you normally do. We enqueue the confirm quit. Then our dequeuer says, the next case I'm going to go to is confirm quit. And then we enqueue as a priority message. Okay? So that means that the very next case I'm going to go to is exit. We dequeue the exit. We go to the exit case. And we stop. These fires, the user event stop, it stops the loop in the, in the bottom. And how do we manage the events? Early on the VI, we created the user event that's called stop. We registered to handle it. And then at the top, on the event structure, we have a case that handles the actual user event stop. And in that case, all we're doing is stopping the upper loop. And because we are good developers, we clean up before we exit. OK, was that a good summary of the NIQ message handler? I did not understand the thing. <laughs> 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 really? Yeah. Oh, oh. Okay, I failed. Again. So Dimitri was saying he didn't understand the thing. So, but for those of you that have used <laughs> an IQ image, hopefully it was a good refresher. If I lost you, I'm sorry, but it's going to get even more exciting. We're just up a hill right now. So any questions before I go? No? All right. Okay. So now we're going to do the DQ image introduction. Why do you have a picture of onions, Fabiola? No, I promise I won't make you cry. These are sweet onions, right? Yes, I won't make you cry. So the reason I put onions there is I am going to be doing a different layer approach to introducing DQMH. First layer is going to be the DQMH project high level, high level description. Arrows, bubbles, very abstract, right? Then I'm going to go down to the second layer, and that's going to be the experience from the end user perspective. And finally, I'm going to give you a tour of the code. The reason I'm not going directly to showing you code is because we have realized, since we put the DQMH out, that it is very important to get the concept of request events and broadcast events. If this concept is not clear, I can show you all the code in the world, and I'm going to lose you. So that's, that's why I'm taking this approach. And I'm letting you know this so the people that are eager to see the code know that I will eventually get to it. All right? You guys ready? 
for the next one? Okay. Here we go. And I have access to the pause button, so if someone wants to ask a question, I can pause. All right. So here we go. All right, DQMH introduction. So how to create a DQMH project? You already installed it. You have a Velocor segment there, and that's the DQMH project. You can select to include or not include the do something uh, messages. This is something that the NIQ message handler doesn't have. If you don't want to use them, you have to go delete them yourself. I'm going to use them because it's easier to do a demo having them. The project structure is, it includes very detailed documentation, and thank you here for Professor Bob because he helped me uh, edit the documentation, gave, gave us good information about it. The application is implemented as a simple state machine. And then you have two libraries. My singleton is implemented as a singleton DQMH. When the application says start, it says okay, starting. The next time the application says my singleton start, it says I'm already running, what's up? The clonable is implemented as a clonable DQMH. What this means is when the application says clonable module start, I get my first instance. The next time it says clonable module start, I get a second instance, and so forth, okay? So that's the difference. So the difference between the singleton and the clonable is that the singleton, there will always be a single instance, and the clonable can have multiple instances. DQMH events. If the application wants a singleton to do something, it's going to, it's going to send a DQMH request. Singleton do something, and then the, some, the singleton does something. For the clonable, my clonable do something, it has to specify if the request is sent to all of the clonables or just a single ID. And then the modules can send broadcast events to indicate that something happened. Okay, so now the end user experience, second layer of the onion here. What happens when you run the main BI is you have a button there that says start my singleton and that starts the user interface of my singleton module, okay? If I click it again, you don't see anything happening because my singleton was already running. If I go to the right, I can say my clonable start and it starts the first instance of that uh, module. When I click the button again, I'm just going to get a different instance. So I have the, no, the one that ends with two, the one that ends with three, and then the one that ends with four. Where am I going to put it? Where am I? Okay, we'll place it there. Okay. What we end up is with a registry of how many clonables we're running. And I have the list. I, I can either send a message to all of them or to pick the ID I want to communicate with. Let's see how the DQMH request works. When I press the, the do something, my singleton receives the request, it did something, and then it broadcast, I did something, and the main application gets it. For the clonable, I have to then say if I'm going to be sending to all of them or to a specific ID. So I'm sending it to the one that ends with two, I say do something, it sends a request to that module, you can see that the other ones still say initial message, the only clonable that got the message then uh, does a bro broadcast uh, request event and we get it on the application main. All right, everybody? Okay. And then you stop it by closing. So now let's see some code. So how does this look like? When we are in the application main, I told you this was a simple state machine. The reason we used the simple state machine was just to show that the code that calls DQMH modules can be anything. It doesn't have to be another DQMH module. We have an initialize case, initialize from panel, UI interlocks, and your event, uh, wait for event, and your exit. And we're going to spend most of our time on the wait for event. So when we press the button, start my singleton module, these are the BIs that do that magic that we saw earlier. This particular BI is the one that's going to send the start, and then we register for the broadcast events here. And that BI that does the synchronize is just saying, I'm ready to receive broadcast events. All right? So it's going to happen. The same is going to be done for the start of my clonable module. And all of this code was automatically created for us. We haven't had to do any code. This is the project template that gets created when you say create a DQMH project. And we have the same thing with the clonable. We have our start. We register. And then we say we're ready to receive uh, broadcast messages, broadcast events. So now, when I say I want to do something, when the button for my singleton does do something is pressed, 
This BI is the one that's going to tell the singleton to do something. Again, it was coded for me. I have not had to do anything up to this point. And in the case of the clonable, we just take which ID I'm communicating with. If I want to send the message to all, I just put a minus one. An example, and then when we do the panel close, um, we discard the case and then we enqueue, not enqueue, we go to the exit on the state machine, and then on the exit, we stop all the modules, we wait for them to be done, and then we exit the main application. So now let's look at what happens on the singleton main side. So if I go to the main uh, for the singleton, we're going to run it first. All the DQMH modules can be run as a standalone. So I'm pressing something and I'm simulating an error. An error will stop my DQMH module if I'm running as a standalone, but if it's being called by something else, then it will, will not stop it. It will broadcast an error. We're going to see on the lower left, that's where I'm creating both the broadcast and the request events. I'm registering to handle request events because this is the ma main singleton. And right there on that event case is where I have handling the do something button. So when the end user presses the do something button on the front panel, I enqueue the something message to the message handling loop. But I have a very similar case. Remember that the application had sent a request that said my singleton do something. So it's this case where I'm handling that request, okay? That enqueue the something, and we go to the something case, doing something, and when I'm done, I'm going to call the I did something broadcast, All right? There's another example of another broadcast that we use is when we have initialized, we send also a broadcast to say that the module did in it. So that's an example of another broadcast. All of this code has been coded automatically for us. Let me put a pause. So those broadcasts, though, are those going to the, the event structure up above or to the other Mac BI? The broadcast goes to any other BI that's registered to listen to them. And oh, there was a question over here. Yeah, the question was, why do you call it broadcast? Because from the example, it's, in the talks, it's just a message to one. So the reason we call them broadcast is the request is anything that's being asked for the module to do and is being executed in the message handling loop. Why, why make such a distinction? It's you, just the message from you, because, one to because the, uh, we're going to get to that. Because the broadcasts are private and can only be fired from the module itself, where the requests are public. Anyone can ask. And the reason for that is it makes it a lot easier to, to maintain a separation between requests, things that are incoming messages, and things that are outgoing messages. Okay, so let me, uh, and I'm gonna do it over again, no, I'm just kidding. So I was all over the way over here, I think. Yeah, so we need to do something. All right, so to stop it, I got the request to stop the module. It enqueues the exit message. I handle my exit. I stop the loop on the bottom. And then we fire the event on the top. We had already stopped the loop on the top. I close, and we're ready to exit the main. And the clonable is going to be very similar. And I'm going to skip it just so we can have time for discussion. But um, I'm just going to let you see that the only difference for the clonable is, is the request handling has to check if the message is sent to that module or not. If it's sent to that module, then it is sent to the message handling loop. If it's not sent to that module, then it is ignored. So uh, each clonable is listening to everything, and it filters yes. out what's yes. not addressed. To every, the question was, every clonable is listening to everything? Yes, we made the decision that the requests are shared among all the clonables. If you put a minus one, they all act on it. If you put in a specific ID, the each clonable module decide, is this for me? No, ignore. Okay. All right, any other questions? But, but that's automatically scripted for you. Yeah, the what part is automatically scripted? Uh, so so, so uh, the, the clonable knows to ignore anything except the one that has yes, it. it is a scripted for you, and when you create a new user event, it already right. has that decision right. code in there. Yeah. All right. 
So, this is a very subjective graph that we put together from talking to our customers and talking to other CLAs and other CLDs. And it is comparing different patterns, learning curve versus complexity. We believe that the state machine is, er is lower on the curve because I can teach that to anyone in one day. Um, producer consumer is a little bit more complicated. The Q message handler is introducing core three. And then private and public events was something that was presented by Justin Gores in 2011. What we found out is that the last 10 years, we have been working on projects. We tend to go either with the Q message handler or with the private and public events. The problem with the private and public events, even you, you think that request and broadcast is confusing, private and public events was a little confusing because the private events were wrapped by public BIs and the public events were wrapped by private BIs. Anytime I would work, come back and work on any of those projects, I had to reacquaint myself with the, um, the nomenclature. And, we, and when we started working with more people, we realized that we were not the only ones that were getting confused with it. Chris had the same problem and some other people that we worked with. So we decided that if we change the terminology from private and public to request and broadcast, it made a little bit more sense, not completely straightforward, but it made a little bit more sense. And also we realized that there was a complexity on dealing with custom events. And that complexity was that the video that I just showed you with the messaging and the arrows and everything, my customers or our customers in general would understand that. Yet, any time that they needed to create a new user event, and I'm seeing some <coughs> smiles there from people that I work with, was that they would have to call me because they felt that there were too many steps and they were going to get it wrong, or there was really more anxiety. So we decided to, um, to script that, and that's why the scripting tools were added. Now, after framework was on that graph, we, um, we know that a lot of the projects that can be addressed with DQMH can also be addressed with actor framework. Deciding which architecture you're going to be using, I think depends on the uh, level of your team. If everyone in your team is comfortable with object-oriented programming, then going with actor framework works really great. If your team has different levels of proficiency, and most of the people on your team are CLAD level, and they're not comfortable <coughs> with object-oriented programming yet, DQMH makes that transition a lot easier. And that's on our experience. So, well, you're here to see the decisions behind the design. So, why did we did the things the way we did it? All right, and I promise I'm gonna go back to the nomenclature thing. I just wanna make sure I cover some of the more crazy stuff. So the DQMH is on the left, the NIQMH on the right there. Here is the NIQMH main. If you go to the initialization section, and I overlap the initialization section from DQMH, you're going to see that they're very similar. The difference is that we save our message queue in BI library. The NIQMH creates a message queue that's unique to each project, so they look the same for all the projects, but they might be customized. The other difference, and again, I'm going to overlap the DQMH initialization on the NIQMH, is that we create our broadcast and request events as uh, process communication, where NIQMH only uses the user event to stop the top loop. We both have our events saved on the project, and they're unique to our project. All internal, external messages are the queue there for the, uh, for the NIQMH. In the BQMH, we make a distinction. Anything that's external message that was either sent via the, the user interaction or via DQMH request is handled on the event structure. Message handling loop then is only handling internal messages. The reason that's important is when you're troubleshooting, when you have multiple BIs that are communicating with each other, it's kind of important to know, am I dealing with something where I can troubleshoot within this BI because the message was received within this BI? Or do I have to go searching for which other BI in parallel send the message? That's why we wanted to have a separation between external and internal. And we consider external requests as well as end user clicking buttons on the front panel. All right? 
Okay. All right, so the DQMH module message is private. The NIQ message handler, any of the parallel loops can have access to the queues. In the DQMH is extensible via events, user events, you just aren't adding new DQMH modules. And the NIQMH is moderately, moderately extensible, uh, you just add new loops. In the case of the DQMH, you can have a dynamic number of parallel tasks, especially if you're using the clonable DQMH. In the case of the NIQMH, you have a static number. So, what I'm going to show you next is really where the majority of our decisions were made on how the QMH was going to be structured. The NIQMH comes with a sample project template. The name of it is Continuous Measurement and Login. If that's all you're doing, if you're just logging two minutes worth of data, saving it to this, you can leave now, that's all you need. If you have to have multiple windows communicating with each other and you're going to be logging to a database or saving to this and, then, and start doing more and more things, then sit down, stay, I'll show you what DQMH does. But if this is all you need, this, this project is sufficient for that. It includes also a nifty uh, settings editor. So some of the challenges. Parallel loops cannot be loaded at different times. If my application does loading of, of acquisitions that I did earlier and do, does analysis <coughs> as well as acquiring, I am forced still to start the data acquisition section. So how many times you have an application that you, you're like, oh, I want to run it, but it's going to be erroring out because I don't have the hardware connected. And I don't care about the hardware because I'm going to be working on this other section. So you cannot start it at different times. Parallel loops cannot be restarted. If you're having problems with hardware, that parallel loop needs to address that error and do the restarting of the hardware. You cannot just say, I'm going to break that loop and restart it and, you know, like maybe send a message saying, you know, I cannot detect your hardware and then just restart the loop. If the application grows, it can get very unruly. Finding where a message was in queue can only be done by doing a text search. Now what happens with those text search? If I look for a start, I'm going to find the, the string constant that says start, I'm going to find the label of the, of the case structure, I'm going to find it on free labels, I'm going to find it on, on bundles, right? And I see a lot of nodding around. So I'm going to do a comparison of both methods. Hey, Pat. Yes. Um, it's worth pointing out, not to take away from what you've done with DQMH, you can take the template for our Cube Message Handler, which is based on Cube Message Handlers that have been around for 15 years, and you can do the kinds of things that you have already done to be able to have multiple parallel loops starting and stopping at different rates and you can launch them. Yeah, you can modify you, you can modify the existing and basically yeah. that's what we did, right? But, we started but with the NIQMH. It's, it's it's it is I, I will say to your credit that it is really nice to have somebody hand that to you because the third time you have to do it on your own it gets really old. Yeah, so <laughs> and and this is this is true. One of the things he says that the third time that you that somebody that you have to start from a project and have to do the modifications over and over can get old. And actually, that's a good segue. One of the things that we're going to be adding for DQMH 3.0 is that for those of you that have evaluated DQMH, but you found things that you didn't like and move along, we are adding a feature where you're going to be able to create your own DQMH modules. So if you want one loop instead of two loops, if you want a timeout on your DQ, if you want that cluster to be a class, if you want, what else can you do? Um, I think that's pretty much it. As long as you keep the labels that we use for our scripting tools, you're going to be able to create a module template. And when you go to that window that says create a new DQMH module, you will have my singleton, my clonable, Bob's template. So if you find yourself adding a, a helper loop every time, you can create that. The value and of tooling in a framework cannot be understated. Uh, Alan is saying that the value of tooling in a framework cannot be understated. So if you guys... Um, are interested in that? We have a beta program going on right now, so let me know and we can add you to that. All right. Question on the complexity part: Do you put DQMH between 
So I, 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 what I showed on that chart is that we started on private and public events. We feel like adding the scripting tools reduce the complexity and changing the nomenclature from private and public to request an event reduce the learning curve. So we feel that by those by combining those two things, we are now at the level of NIQMH. And again, it's there's a diagram. Right? Okay, I cannot measure that. Where's my mouse? There it is. Okay, here we go, guys. Oh, come on. There we go. Okay, NIQMH continuous measurement and logging sample project. So that's already shipping with your LabVIEW. You go create it. What it does, it creates a module for uh, doing the main, and you can see that your acquisition loop and your motion, your login, are the parallel loops there. When you create the queues, you end up with a, a creation of a queue for each one of your parallel loops, and they're all stored in a message queues cluster. This message queue cluster is then shared by all the parallel loops. All right? So what happens with scalability? Months go by, and now you want to add a simple, let's make it five simple process control loops, and let's add one motion control loop just for uh, fun here. So you end up with a project now that has something like this, where your main has all your parallel loops, right? And then so you have your five processes there and your motion control loop. And now you have to add a creation of a queue for each one of, the, of those uh, parallel loops. And when you want to start them all, your messaging starts to look like this, all right? So what if the, all control processes are identical? And what if the number of processes that I want to use is going to be determined later? So let's use the DQMH. What we're going to do in this case, the acquisition is going to be a singleton and the process control is going to be a clonable DQMH. If I want to determine at runtime how many processes I want to run, all I have to do is put a for loop around the creation of my clones and I'm done. Reusability. Months go by and now you want to use the motion control that you use in a different project. If I drag the NIQMH motion loop to my block diagram, I'm going to have tons of errors. Because remember, the queues were unique. The queue library is unique to each project. Let's say that I managed to get the control loop. Now the problem I have is when I want to wire the queues, they're not of the same type. Because, and after I get all the errors sorted out, because the project that I'm working on right now only inspects a user interface queue where the project the motion loop was in had five process control queues and the, mo the motion and the UI. So all the moving around of wires and changes, it's quite daunting. Now, reusability with DQMH. I'm gonna drag or copy the DQMH module to a new project. And then I'm gonna create a new BI. And you're gonna see that I didn't get any errors. When I go and create a new BI, all I have to do, because I already have the project there, I have access to all of my API functions just by using quick drop. So I can, or dragging them from the project. So I already have my start module, my synchronizing, I can register for events. So I'm gonna be building a very simple BI. Who can show magic there? And what all we're gonna do is we're gonna start the uh, acquisition module we are going to show the dynamic terminals. We're registering to handle the broadcast events. And then I'm going to go to edit and say, I want to show an LED when the module starts running. And then I'm going to show an LED there. And, and then we're just going to stop it. So the nice thing here is my code is only broken while I'm wiring. But I didn't have to deal with any errors. I also didn't have to go to my existing module and removing code because the module stands on its own. Right? Okay, so it, then we put the terminal and now if I uh, wire everything and just run the VI, very simple. It's going to run, turn the init, and then shut down my module. Alright? So, 
Again, if you all you want to do is have that acquisition and that login loop and that's all you need, that's sufficient. The challenge comes when you want to extend and have more modules and have more messages. Okay? Question. Is readability of your DQMH plumbing important for your customer base? So the question was, is the readability of the DQMH important for our customer base? So the reason we wanted to keep it similar to the NIQMH is that I don't want to have customers call me to support questions that are lab you questions, right? They can call an AE support, and the AEs will recognize and be familiar with the code. If I go too far away, then the AEs are going to be like, I cannot really help you because I don't understand your code. So that's, that's the reason why we kept it very similar to an image. Now, if in your team you're using an architecture totally different, but there are things that you're finding out that are repetitive, we can help you automate them. So like I said at the beginning of the talk, this is just an example that we put out. Yeah. So you the could question talk. was the readability of the code you generate. Is it important to customers? Why? Why are uh, would they ever go looking at your code? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And the code, the code is not password protected. So you can, all of that code is available for you. Uh, you should be better off using dependency injection. We had this discussion before, uh, Dimitri. We have had this discussion before. That's not my target audience. OK. <laughs> Introducing user events. So one of the things about user events, I think they're poorly named. They should have been called customer dynamic events. Yes. And, um, and actually, I have a video that I'm not going to show because I don't think I'm going to have time for that, um, where if you go on the help, they now call them on the help custom events. So if you do a search for LabVIEW custom events, now you get the help for user events. But they're still called user events on the puppets. Uh, several required steps. You have to create, <coughs> register, fire, handle, destroy. We're no longer dealing with something that is create, use, destroy. There's a lot more steps involved there. And there's also certain steps when you're creating, like you have to create your argument first. You have to name it before you wire it into the create user event. And this is all these little details that was, that was causing that my customers that use LabVIEW one month out of the year would call back, you know, I haven't touched the code in 18 months, but now we need to add a new message, and I know you already show me how to do this, but I'm not getting the name. Or they would be one, one of the steps. That's when I was like, we need to script this. Um, and I think that they're underused. What I find when I'm talking to intermediate and advanced lobby developers is I ask them, are you familiar with user events? Of course. And I'm like, I'm not talking about the end user clicking buttons. Oh, you're not? Right? Because for us, our end user is our user. For an I, all LabVIEW developers are users of LabVIEW. So that's why they're called user events. A um, little bit of trivia there. Yes. So, <laughs> so, um, so why was going to do that? So they're underused. So people think that the events can o are only used to send a message from the lower loop to the upper loop, and that's it. So I think we have a beautiful Cadillac that can go, or a beautiful sports car that can go super fast, and we're riding it 10 miles an hour. Right? All right, so why do we use user events for inter dqmh communication? Broad broadcast makes it easier to send a message to the world. It doesn't matter if they are listeners or not. This is one of my favorite things. Why? An event queue is created for each listener. So every time that you are doing that registration on the event structure and wiring to the dynamic, to show dynamic terminals, what you're doing is behind the scenes creating an engine that's actually enqueuing your events. So why not just use an event queue as a separate for each module? We're going to get to it. So an event queue is created for each listener. If there are no listeners, then no event queue is created. So what happens if I am enqueuing messages to a queue that's no longer there, or that, not, that is still there, but nobody is dequeuing? What happens if I keep enqueuing in a queue and nobody is dequeuing? It fills up. It fills and you'll end up with a memory leak, right? Yeah. With the uh, event structure, with the user events, if I'm firing events and nobody is registered to listen, there's no memory leak. 
So this means now that my module can be either plugged to the rest of the world, or it can be unplugged, and I can use it as a standalone. That makes it reusable. Right? Okay. Events in the same event queue do not have to have the same data type, and that's why I cannot just have a queue. Because in the queue, I would have to convert everything to a string and a variant, or a numerator and a string, whatever flavor you like. With the events, I can have in a single event structure be handling different messages with different data types. What I love about this is that your errors are edit time errors, not runtime errors. Uh, many of you have seen error 91? Yeah? And what happens with error 91? There's a chance that you're not the one that finds it, that it's the end user that gets it. Right? Because it's in this obscure area and you forgot to change the message or, ch or check it there. So that's why we like events. Um, external events, GUI interactions or communication from other modules are separated from internal communications. So the message queue handles internal communications, my event structure handles external communications. There's, uh, this is an advanced technique. You can possibly, you can temporarily unregister from an event. If you wire an empty user event reference to your registration, it unregisters for that event. That's another thing that's very powerful. You can have different levels of user and say, for this user, I simply won't even register for those events. Right? But as soon as the other user logs in, now I'm going to register for them. Uh, the event handling loop serves as to marshal the information to the message handling loop. And I could probably keep going on and on and on. If you, if you have been to my advanced architectures and lab course, when I teach it, it's, it's National Instruments Advanced Architectures, but when I teach it, how, many, how much time do I spend talking about events? <laughs> it's like, I, lo I love user events. Again, I think that they are misused and that they are super powerful. So, that's why I'm not going to bore you anymore. Then, um, how are we doing on time? 15 minutes, okay, so should, I should probably show you. So I'm gonna show you our favorite part of the DQMH, and it is the scripting tools. So how do you create a new event? You go to tools, Delacor, DQMH, create new DQMH event, and that pop up, pops up a wizard. On the wizard, you select which DQMH module you wanna create your event for, you decide what type of event you're creating, a request or a broadcast. You give it a name. You give it a description that then is going to be included as your context help description for your VI. And the reason we have a front panel for the arguments window instead of a running VI is because you can use quick drop with this. So you can use quick drop, and that means your arguments can be anything. It can be a class, it can be a cluster, it can be a type of, it can be an enumerator, whatever you want. And uh, both the request API and the argument are created for us. The other thing, this, and, and the cluster is there, so if later on you decide that you wanted to add more things to your argument, it's already there. The, thing, the next thing that the scripting tool does is it breaks your tester API. And the reason it breaks it is because it's adding a message there that says, go ahead and put on the front panel of the tester how is it that you're going to test that the request that you just created works. You know that the, me the messaging mechanism works, but how are you going to test the code that you're about to make? So in this case, we're creating a change front caller um, event. So all I'm doing is taking the new value of the caller box and wiring it to the VI that was automatically created for me. The blue tag that says code needed was created for me. And it includes the name that I gave to the request. So it's really like becomes like coloring by numbers, right? All right, so that's a test, a test API. The text entered enter during the event creation becomes part of the context help. And the BI that was created for me has a call to the request events. That request event, this was created for me. I never had to go in here. I never had to go and create a new event. It was a scripted for me and it was added to the cluster. And the firing of the event was scripted for me. I didn't have to do that. It's already done. All right, the other BI that gets broken is the main BI. 
And I have a broken arrow, and I have, again, my code-needed labels that are very similar to the ones that you find in MIQMH. And it has instructions, and it tells me, register for the request event that's called change from panel color. By the way, you can use that filter to search for events. And note that the argument name that I use, I use the name FP color. That's what is on the, on the node. And the data type is the correct data type. The scripting tool also created for me the message case. It also created the enqueue, right? It did that for me, and then just has a label there saying, this is where you would handle the change from panel uh, color. And because it's a cooking show, I have already magically shown all the code. And I have to straighten my wire just because the OCD keeps in. So if we go and run the test, I start the module. And of course, I need to show the front panel so I can show you the change in color. And when I change the color, and obviously when you do these demos, you have to go for the bright colors, right? Um, so it's just, so how long would it take you to do this if you had to code it from the beginning? So now let's create a broadcast event. I go to DQMH, create new DQMH event, and this time, instead of selecting a request, I'm gonna select a broadcast. And it asks me if I want to use the argument of an existing request. This is because we found ourselves that using this, a lot of times the request and the broadcast had the same argument, so we just made it easier for them to be shared. <coughs> so if the scripting tools are working, what they did is they added a new BI that's completely scripted for me that's gonna be doing the firing of the broadcast. They, the scripting tools broke my tester and added an event case with a code needed blue label there that says go ahead and register for the call from panel color change. So I select it and now I just, you know, I have to show it. And just because I wanted to make it interesting, we're going to create the most expensive uh, RGB color to RGB uh, converter. So we're just going to make this an, an integer and we're going to change it to hexadecimal and then go and add the code on the block diagram of the main. So my tester is now working, but if I run it, obviously it's not gonna work because I haven't added the code to the main BI. So I'm gonna go to the project, run my main in the singleton, I find it there, and it's gonna have a broken arrow, go to the block diagram, again, I have my blue label there, and my BI that was scripted for me is hanging there and it just says, place me wherever you, th you think you're gonna be handling this. And then we're placing it there. We're wiring the color that we want to broadcast, that it just changed. And we have a running arrow. Again, how long would this have taken if you had done it everything by hand? And now I run it, start my module, show the module panel. And I'm going to change the color to something that's easy for us to see. So I'm going to do red 3, um, blue, green 4, and blue 5. I that just to make it easy and so you see that I'm not pulling your leg and I do okay and you can see that the hexadecimal numbers are those. All right. So we found that the scripting tools were very useful and, and I'm going to make this joke later. We're married to the DQMH but it's an open relationship. Uh, we realize that when we go and audit other um, software, they might have an architecture that is well developed and works well for them, we're not going to force them to use DQMH. But it might be that they can take advantage of user events. So 3.0 is going to have the option for you to create your own DQMH um, event libraries that are standalone and can be used in projects that are non-DQMH. People, we're giving the house away. Right. I really wanted you to hire us to automate these things for you. Uh, in that example, the broadcast event, so is this essentially the sub BI, your singleton, mm -hmm. is then telling the tester mm -hmm. that I am this color that you sent me to be, basically? Is that yeah, yeah that, that was it. Yeah, the, the, we were sending the request that said, change the front panel color to the, uh, the front panel color to this color. And then when we were done changing the color, we broadcast, this is the color I changed to. So this is a reply mechanism. It's a reply mechanism. It's a reply mechanism, mechanism, but it's a it's a synchronous. I didn't yes, want I didn't want to go into all the re all the request types we have. We have a request type that is request and wait for reply. 
and that creates a synchronous mm -hmm. request. So that's, that's available as well. So I know that some of you Is really... this the only channel where the clonables can send something to the uh, application level? Any BQMH module can send a message to anyone that is registered to listen to their broadcast. Yeah. So you could have a class, PI, and that be registered to listen to the broadcast, it will get the broadcast. Uh, doesn't this become a bottleneck in a larger application? We have done benchmarking and we it's working well. If you have something that's high priority or needs to run faster, you can always have event structures in the, that are parallel in different mm -hmm. loops. One of the things that, you know, to those of you that have read the caveats on the help for the event structures, it says to not handle uh, an event in more than one place in a, in a block diagram. For whatever reason, in our minds, that, that translates to I can only have an event structure in a block diagram. That's not what the help says. You can have different event structures as long as they're not registered for the same event. All right? Okay, so singleton versus clonable. Why did we have two module types? Singleton is the most common use. And we found that, it, that can, st can um, a start module, you can call it as many times as you want. This means I can have different modules plug in to a module that's already running. We also found out that clonable requires a significant amount of code management support. I mean, we take care of most of it, but the developer still has to figure out which IV am I talking to? How many IDs do I have open? All that type of stuff. So we realized that if we wanted to address the CLV that's kind of like low level intermediate or, the, or make it possible for CLADs to work on this code, we needed to lower the barrier of entry and that's why we created a singleton. We found out that really 98% of the time, you never really need a clonable. All right, what? API testers. So API, why did we add API testers? Test individual modules without having to execute the entire application. The number of times that I have to go on site because the customer did not have a way to test things individually, if they want to pay for it, go ahead. Um, so it also helps you fine tune API requirements. It makes you think about what does this action need as an argument in, in order to execute? And that thought process makes your API more streamlined. Because you're no longer mixing or, or coupling your module with your application. There's no need to create a debug log file. Now you have your API tester can be used as a sniffer and you can see what's going on there. You can also inject messages. Leaves desktop execution trace toolkit for ext extreme cases. If you add your API tester to your build specification, you have now a sniffer that was created for you. And this is aggressive Fabiola here. You get them for free, use them, okay? <laughs> All right. Uh, the amount of people that have told me, oh, it's kind of annoying that the scripting does that, I just delete the tester, or I just delete the event case when it creates it for me, I'm like, believe me, trust me, please, please, use it. When you get to a weird case, when you're having to troubleshoot, your code not doing or not behaving, you're gonna thank me that you had that tester there. All right? Pretty much every time I write an actor, I have to make, write a manual test harness for it. So Alan is saying he, that any, anytime he, he writes an actor, he has to write a manual hard, a testing harness for it. So we are providing 80% of the code there. Give it a try. You're gonna see how powerful it is. If you have, for example, a module that's doing several things and you don't wanna wait an hour for that request to happen, you can inject it from the tester, right? Because you're sending the request and uh, What, if, sorry, I, uh, I, may have, I may have dozed off. What is an API tester and where is that in your code? Um, when you create the project or when you create a DQMH module, yes. because by the way, I started from the project template, but you can create new DQMH modules for existing projects. It creates the library itself and it, and it adds the tester as well. And anytime you use oh. a requ and anytime you add a request event or a broadcast event, it breaks the tester and it opens it for you. So it's right there on your face. Okay. <laughs> All right, so summary, what is DQMH, Delacorte Q Message Handler? 
Woohoo! <laughs> there you go. Uh, it's accessible to NI support because it's very similar to the NI QMH. It's accessible to CLDs because it's very similar to the NI QMH. CLADs can contribute to a DQMH project. They say that templates and all this scripting stifles creativity. I really want junior developers to be creative within their case, in their case structure. They don't need to be creative on the mess in their process communication. We have already gone down that path. The application already stops. The error handling is already there. If it stops doing that, it's because you added the code that made it stop. And now we have a localized area where we can see where the junior developer <coughs> in their immense creativity ended up hanging themselves, right? <laughs> Works with test end. It comes with a shipping example. The shipping example for DQMH includes three test end sequences. And it includes the same code in LabVIEW and then in test end. Uses LBOOK but does not require to understand it. You, did you see me showing you at all the OP? You really don't need it unless you are really stubborn and want a timeout on your DQ. Uh, supports multiple instances. The scripting tools reduce anxiety. And did I mention that you want an award? <laughs> <laughs> all right, what's next? I already made the announcement of these things. You're going to be, we're married to the DQMH, but it's an open relationship. Um, it's coming of uh, 2016, beta open now. There are some examples of applications that have been completed that we know of. I want to think that the DQMH is really well documented and it's working great because we're not hearing people using it. Like, there's a few questions in the forums. And I want to think that it's because it's so great that people don't need support. It would be nice to hear what applications you're building with DQMH. What are the features that you want? What are the things that, uh, that annoy you? Um, to learn more, uh, Chris is going to be presenting with Matthias from Studio Bots Understanding Test System Performance. Chris is my business partner in Delacor. The DQMH Toolkit is free. You can find more information at Delacor.com. Walking the Wires is our blog. We tend to go very, sometimes, what do we say? Yeah, we, we're not very um, proficient, but we're, no, not proficient. Consistent. consistent. We're not very consistent in publishing uh, blog posts. Uh, but what we do, we hear that people really like them because we go into detail on how the steps are. Um, we have a video channel. So if you don't want to sit there and read all the documentation, we have videos. And the videos that I show you are going to have audio and will be up there soon. And uh, we're no longer a nominee. We actually won the award. <laughs> okay, guys. So any questions? <laughs> that, that question comes, uh, comes in a lot. We have some people on the, on the Delacor, doc, uh, if you go to ni.com groups and look for Delacor, there are a couple of guys that posted that and they have tried it and they have a list of the caveats. At Delacor ourselves, we have not tried it yet. But the, the events should work. What, what was the question? Uh, the question was, does it work with real time? And yes, so the, uh, the, the caveats are there and the short answer is yes, it works with so you're concentrating on the, so you basically have an actor model, right? Mm -hmm. Between all those uh, modules running in parallel and asynchronously communicating to each other. So, but you're kind of enforcing the most primitive state machine of, as far as the architecture uh, it's not a state of, machine. of the particular, uh, of the single module goes. Uh, you still leave it, uh, when you generate that um, uh, individual module, singleton or clonable, the basic architecture of that module Aside from the uh, queue, uh, from the, the events uh, as means of communication, it, this, the architecture of that module itself is still the primitive, uh, most primitive Moore state machine. Is that correct? It's not a state machine because you're in queuing and you're getting queues out of order. So you okay, this whatever that 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 was that's a leftover from the NI queue uh, message. Handling. It's a producer consumer. Producer right. consumer, right? Sing yeah. Single queue. Yeah. But the way you get your multiple queues is by having different event structures. So we have actually projects where we have a helper loop that is registered to event structure that all it does is reading data, the, right? The, and the, then the other ones... The deficiencies the of regular queues aside that you mentioned, right? Mm -hmm. 
it still looks like much simpler to have each module to have the same structure whether it's a, you know Mealy state machine or Moore state machine uh, or even hierarchical state <coughs> machine I don't know if you ever heard about lab HSM toolkit so but uh, it, all, all it takes is basically one event queue, one action queue, and one messaging queue to, to have them all look the same and exchange uh, messages between each other through just messaging queues. So we find that the events are a lot more powerful than using queues. And they allow us to separate the uh, messages or the events received via requests. We can create our own priorities by having different loops well, in parallel. Prioritizing, that's a different story. You can, uh, you can assign priority. So what is, what is your concern? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not getting what the uh, question the, is. The initial question was, you still, uh, it looked to me that you enforce on the, on the end user that whatever that... Most on the end user, no, on a developer? What do on I the developer, What we yes, do you no, enforce on the developer? You're in, in, enforcing on them that initial uh, structure of the module itself that you and I have. You, you put this more sophisticated uh, communication structure between those modules, but the basic uh, architecture of each module itself remains the same as it is. In yes, the we chose it. We chose that architecture because that we found was the architecture that more, a lot more people were comfortable with. But like I said earlier, we're married to the DQMH, but it's an open relationship. I, you know, you might have your own architecture, and if you know if you want us to do a, a code review, we can definitely do it. And there might be other things that can be automated in your architecture. We chose this architecture so we could, we could show how to automate development tasks. We want the developers to focus on the problem at hand, solving the problem at hand. You don't need to be having a developer having to do, OK, I want a cluster. Let me name it. Let me wire it to the create user event. Let me create the type that. Let me add it to the type that. Oh, I forgot to the destroy. I need to go do the destroy. Oh, yeah, by the way, I have to wrap it in a, in a VI. And the other thing by automating is we're creating a consistent style. And we are encouraging developers to not use naked calls on the top level VI. So now, what some people ask me, why, Fabiola, why do you like, why don't you, you don't like native, um, naked calls? On, and what I mean by naked calls is primitives. It's not that I don't like them, it's that finding where I'm firing an event, I don't want to have to do a search for the generate event. I want to do a search for where is it that I'm calling the change from pan caller. So by adding the scripting, we're creating a VI that I can find where that VI is being used at. And then I can provide to other junior developers a public API that is very clear on what are the requests that you can send to this module. Yes, So Alan? I think you said that, I guess it's the next release where you'll be able to set your own yeah. template for yeah. a module, yeah. which if you don't like the classic Q message handler, you could swap out for something else and something still be plugged replicate, into her. Replicate those. Uh, with having all the plumbing. Yeah, now the thing is, it does, you can create your own modules, but they still have to be event, they well, still sure, have to have sure. an event structure. I, I, I'm, envision, I'm envisioning the event structure on the top and whatever else you want. Yeah, one on the bottom, yeah. Which could be something that yeah. looked more like a and, and, and if when you try it, we you, you find out that you cannot use the automatic tools and you want us to, you know, to work together and create something else, um, you know, we can talk and, and, and help you automate it. Get the same level of automation, but for your architecture. Like, for example, you guys have a really nice, uh, what, is, what is it called, the, the JAMA? No, so the so JAMA is an architecture that um, Jet, um, that Rob uh, has created, and there might be things that you want to automate there. We did that, yeah. You already did it. <laughs> um, what I find sometimes in, in, in teams of developers is like, Scripting is a different animal, right? And you can invest in your people learning how to do it, but most of the time that's not part of the product that you want to deliver. So we can get that automation out of the way a lot faster uh, and let you focus on, again, resolving the problem at hand. We're all about, I was so happy when, when Jeff K this morning was putting reuse, intuitive, and rapid. What we're doing is that we're lab is already getting you on the graphical. Now we're pushing you farther so you can focus on solving the problem at hand 
and not have to be spending time on coding, communication, and stopping, and things that you have already figured out. All right, any other questions? So please, if you try it out, if you go download the DQMH, go to the, the, the support forums. If you don't feel like writing in the public forum, send us an email, info at delacore.com. We really want to hear what you guys are doing. And if you want to try out the beta uh, version, just let me, let me know, and we'll give you uh, access to it. So you can start playing with creating your own DQMH modules. And, and the things that you don't agree with uh, how we did, you can go and change. All right, thank you guys.